Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 28, we're going to take another look at my prototype E80CC preamp. We're going to look at the circuit, and we're going to look at grounding, particularly grounding as it relates to ground loops. But first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Last week we did an overview of the prototype build, and this week we're going to go deep. So let's start with the data sheet. All new designs start with the data sheet, or perhaps with a vision of what you'd like to create. Then you got to get into the hard facts. This is a later Philips data sheet for the E80CC, or SQ tube, special quality. It applies to all the E80CC tubes. And I've talked at length in other videos about the E80CC, but basically it's a twin triode, so two identical tubes inside one envelope. And this is a really detailed data sheet. It helps the designer. It's filled with information. And like all data sheets, we'll get design maximums, so we need to keep every, all our values, our operating points, inside of those maximums. Now you're always going to get uh, typical characteristics of the tube which help you design a circuit. In this case they actually have operating characteristics so they, they actually give us the entire circuit. They give us three various uh, operating points and all of the uh, resistors required to get us to those operating points. Now you can work off of this or you can work off of um, the graph of the operating points, the grid lines. And what I did was I chose one of the operating points that the Phillips engineers created, and I started from there. Now, it's easy enough to reverse engineer and find out where Phillips put the operating point. So I built a test circuit, and here's my operating point. I have a B plus of approximately 250 volts. That puts the plate at 135 volts after the um, plate resistor. And I measured 2.9 milliamps. So that's my center operating point because it does, I call it the center because it does swing around with the audio signal. So here we've got the milliamps. This is the plate current. Here we've got the voltage of the plate down here. Here we've got the grid lines. These are all the operating points of the tube. Two watts up here is the maximum plate dissipation. They've marked the line right up here. And here is the load line. But this little red dot here, that's, that's our operating point. And you can easily calculate the GM from here by shifting one volt on the grid. So we're just below minus three on the grid bias. So if we go up to minus two or just before it, and we measure the, the current, we get 2.2 milliamps per one volt of, of grid voltage change. This is, this is how um, the UK and Australia measure GM milliamps per one volt of grid change, of grid voltage change. But in North America and many places in the world, it's measured in micromoles, and the math is quite easy to establish what our micromoles are, and they come in at 2200. Now, the spec says that the um, the maximum average or center GM is 2700, so we're below it by a nice little bit. And that's fairly normal for operating points. You don't want to be sitting up near the maximum operating point of a tube. Now, to measure the gain, we just simply measure across on the horizontal here to the next grid line. And we subtract the difference in voltage. And in this case, 
we've got 135 volts minus 105. That gives us a, a mu or an u or a gain, all the same thing, folks, of approximately 30. The spec says 27. I probably didn't measure quite. The, the definition on these squares is not that great. You know, one square is 5 volts. So, why did Phillips pick this operating point? Well, it's moderate. It's not way up at the very edge of what the operating point voltage-wise is of the plate or way up here near the maximum plate dissipation, or way down here in this non-linearity. You can see here when the grid lines curve, these, this is the operating points of the tube in circuit. When they curve like that, that's non-linearities, and you don't want that in an audio tube. Our operating point is up here where the grid lines are fairly parallel and straight. So that's, that's a good moderate point. So. Thank you, Phillips. Okay. Next. All amplifiers will start with a power supply, and ours is no different. There's actually a video about, about this particular power supply, and I'll put a link below, so we're just going to take a quick look at it. The main thing to know is that this is a, a dual mono dual power supply design. So it's actually got a separate power supply for um, the right channel and a separate power supply for the left channel. The biggest changes I made on this design over the previous 6 or 12 SN7 preamp, which shares the same basic design, is that I tried it without the bleeder resistor. Now this is a safety resistor. It takes the high voltage off of the filter capacitors and any filter capacitors further further downstream. So you do the, you remove this at your own risk. I did that because I wanted to reduce the number of return ground wires because I was struggling with um, ground loop issues. We'll talk about that in detail in a minute. If you pull out the bleeder resistor, the 2K2 switches to a 10K and that gives us a B plus of approximately 250 volts, which is a very common voltage for um, voltage amplifiers. Okay, so here's the circuit. It's going to be very similar to the 6 or 12 SN7. The biggest differences were a little change to the cathode resistor and how it's grounded. So basically the audio comes in, goes through a 100k pot, your volume control, comes through a coupling capacitor of 0.1 microfarad, I'm showing the audio signal nominally in the positive phase here, just to, so we can see how the phase of the signal changes. And if I was drawing this correctly, actually, I would have drawn this small, because it comes as a very small signal from, let's say, a CD player, which will have uh, a nominal uh, supply voltage of 2 volts. It lands on the grid here. Remember, we've got two tubes and I've separated them so you could see them better but the heater is literally the cathode is literally wrapped around the heater it gets the cathode extremely hot which boils off electrons the plate is positive or negative down here the electrons come flying off at extremely high speed towards the plate that's where they're attracted our signal lands onto the grid which is just a wire that's wrapped around and around our cathode. That brings the audio signal into the tube. The audio signal is AC. It, modu it modulates our flow of electrons and that modulation shows up here on the high voltage on the B+. Plus. Here's our 250 volts coming in. Here's our plate resistor which drops our voltage down. So the signal appears up here as a much larger signal. This is the voltage amplifier stage, or the gain stage of the circuit. Because the signal is taken off the plate, the signal inverts. So you can see we're starting off in the negative phase instead of the positive. We direct couple here to the next half of the tube. Onto the grid we go. And if you look at the tube design here, you'll see that we've literally inverted the design. 
the uh, anode or plate resistor is 47K on the gain stage, the first stage, and here it's down here on the cathode. Now what that allows us to do is to, to balance out this design so we can, we can direct couple here and here we've got high gain, high impedance, which is no good for driving another stage. Here we come off with no gain or what's called unity or zero gain and we come off with low impedance. We go through a coupling capacitor. Coupling capacitors just block out the DC and they allow the AC, our audio signal, to pass through cleanly because you can't put high voltage DC onto a pair of patch cords into your next stage. Very bad things are going to happen if you do that. Because we've come off the cathode, the signal stays in the same state it was in the previous stage. If we'd taken it off the plate, it would have inverted again. And out we go on the RC. That's all there is to it. The heater voltage is DC. It's 12 volts DC. It's supplied by switch mode power supply. I like to use switch mode power supplies because they get me a fairly clean source of DC onto the heater. And the reason that's important is you can put AC onto the heater, but on the early stages of the amplifier, the, the main voltage gain stage here of the preamp, the AC, if it's got any noise at all, can be picked up. It'll be, remember, it'll be sitting literally right, the cathode will be sitting wrapped right around that, that heater. It can be transduced so that that AC noise lands right onto the grid, which is just the wire that's wrapped around the cathode. And we don't want AC noise on our circuit. It's very hard to get it out. So DC, if it's if it's a clean switch mode power supply, and they're just those bricks you use to power up your laptop. Now, 12.6 is the center voltage AC or DC for the heater on virtually all of this type of tube. But 12 volts DC is a more common voltage available on these switch mode power supplies. And 12 volts will work just fine, folks. You wouldn't want to be up around 13. You'd have to drop it. But 12, we just put it straight in. Okay, now, if you've been following my channel, you might say, Jim, that circuit looks a lot like your 6 or 12 SN7 preamp, and it does. In fact, it's the first time that I used a direct coupling stage successfully. The difference, there's a couple of differences. One, the cathode resist, resistor changed a little bit in value, and two, the grounding of the circuit changed significantly, and we'll get right into that. Okay, let's just flip it over so we can look at it all. Now, it's easy to focus on the, the B+, plus, the audio through the circuit, and it's very easy to forget about the grounding, but every circuit has to have a return to ground for it to function. And if you get the return to ground side of the circuit wrong, it doesn't matter how good your B plus is or how good your RCA is, how well shielded the cable is. You can see here we've got shielded cable on the RCA outs. You're going to have noise. So how I ended up with this design is kind of interesting. A week ago, I had a Actually, two weeks ago now, I had a working prototype. It sounded good, but it had too much hum. 120 cycle hum and a nice little high-frequency buzz on the tweeters as well. Now, I've got extremely efficient uh, speakers, so any noise at all I'm going to hear, which is it's good for auditioning tubes for customers, and it's good for auditioning prototypes because I hear the noise instantly. Now, 120 hertz or cycle hum means rectified power supply AC noise is getting into my audio chain somewhere. Now, if it was 60 hertz, it would be back here at the wall before the, um, the power transformer. But after you rectify it, you, you double the frequency of the noise, so it's at 120 hertz. Now, the filtering stages should get out 
all of that unless your filtering stage is not up to it or unless that noise before the filtering stage is getting picked up somewhere in the preamp circuit. Now, my rule of thumb is if I can hear the noise during silent parts of the music from my listening position, there's too much noise. So I spent three days trying to filter out the noise. I added small caps, large caps, extra filter stages. I moved wires around live. And I had some success at quieting down the mid-range hum, but those tweeters were still buzzing away. Now, the music was perfectly listenable to. We're talking about low-level noise, noise that is distracting only on um, very quiet passages or in the gaps between music, but still totally unacceptable in my opinion. So I did some research and I kept seeing messages in various forums, forums talking about a grounding issue in ground loops. Well, I thought I knew how to properly ground an amp, but obviously not. I found Blue Glow's amazing video on the subject. I'll put a link below for that, a video I've watched before. But this time I listened closely to everything Dave had to say. And damn, in a couple of minutes I knew I'd managed to create multiple ground loops. It only took an hour to reorganize the grounds and eliminate 90% of the noise. Let me show you what I did. So, part of what happened is I've switched to these dual power supply, dual mono designs. So I've got more circuitry. I've got twice, almost twice the power supply circuitry. So, in the past, let me grab a little pen here and see if we can make some notes. So, in the past, what I did was I worked with what's called a star ground. Let me just draw it in here for you. So, everything would come back here. My safety coming in from the wall would come back here. My power supply grounds would come over here, all of them, and then I would bring my RCA out grounds back here, my RCA in grounds back here, my preamp circuit back here, ay ay ay. So what happens with ground loops is you end up with various return, uh, essentially zero voltages piling on top of each other, and you end up with voltage differences. And voltage differences on what is supposed to be a balanced ground in which everything is nominally at the same voltage, nominally zero volts, though it's, it's never going to be exactly zero, it'll be somewhere close to that, you end up with what's called ground loops. And that brings all sorts of potential noise into the circuits where the loops occur. So what I did was, let me just put my favorite pen away here before I run out of ink. Okay. So what I did was what Dave suggested, and I went from one single star ground or a hybrid star ground, because my preamp circuit would have a few grounds in the circuit on the prototype board, and I'd gang the RCAs in together on one, one single wire. But essentially I had a star ground for everything. So what he said to do was to bring the green safety ground, this is the, the house or the mains safety ground, straight to the chassis bolted on. So that's what I did. Can you see the bolt down there? It's right, it's tough to see, it's right in here. So it goes immediately to the chassis through a bolt. Then he said, bring your power supply grounds to one point nearby, close to that safety ground. And that's what I did. I, did, I brought both the um, left and right channel power supplies to one point here. And you can see the four wires right there. And then he said, bring all of the sensitive side of the preamp to one star ground point, separate and further down chassis. So here is the star ground for the center, for the sensitive side of the preamp. So the, the shields on the RCAs come straight to there. 
the ground on the volume pot goes straight in. You can see the wire right here, it goes straight in. Now there's still several ground points on the proto boards for each preamp circuit. Uh, so they get ganged together at one point on the prototype PCB and they each individually now go to ground. And wow, that that's all it took. It took about an hour of reorganizing grounds. Let me show you the wires that came out. Now some of these are just jumpers that were just jumpers of convenience on the power supply board. And of course I got rid of uh, the bleeder side here and there's a return on the bleeder side to ground as well. And of course every time you get rid of one component on a dual power supply or a dual preamp, you get rid of two, right? So everything multiplies by a factor of two virtually. And I was extremely impressed. Um, that's probably the quietest preamp I've ever built. If I put my ear into a very uh, efficient tweeter with a waveguide, I have to get my ear virtually into the waveguide to hear the noise on the circuit. It's there. Even the R8 itself, which is a very quiet uh, integrated amplifier, has a certain amount of noise that you can hear. If I back up a foot from my speakers, I can't hear a thing. It's dead, dead quiet. Okay. So I think I think I have I have a huge um, a huge thank you to go out to Blue Glow. His videos are extremely good. They're instructional. He's usually Dave is almost always bang on. He does some good research, and of course. Uh, like me, he builds prototypes, so he doesn't just talk about the theory, he actually puts it in practice, which is useful beyond a, beyond any measure for, for people who are actually uh, building their own gear. Theory only gets you so far. Okay, now, what, what's come in in the last week? Well, it's actually been a very quiet week, but let me show you what I'm working on. Oh, and let me show you a, a fun discovery. So, a whole bunch of these really nice preamp tubes came in. And these things are known by a whole bunch of different names. Um, DET20 is one, uh, CV6 uh, is another, 2C22 is another. They're all the same valve. And basically, it's the development of the 6J5. A 6J5 is one half of a 6SN7, which is a very popular preamp tube. Now, I'm always looking for quality valves that are going to be fun to play with. And this is super fun, isn't it? One of these caps goes to the plate directly, and one goes to the grid. And the reason for that is this is a high-frequency version of the 6J5. And a few people who have worked with this in audio... Uh, have really liked uh, the sound of these tubes. So I thought, well, let's put it in the driver stage of an interesting uh, power tube. Oh, and I wanted to show you something. So these were, most of these had extra labels added. So GEC valve was on these things, and it says made in England for uh, the General Electric Company of England. Um, GEC is what they went under and later on. These tubes probably are Second World War vintage tubes, so they're quite old. They're all new old stock, so it was really quite a nice find. And whenever you see Made in England, that always should be, that should be, I always say, red alert, red alert, that it might be a mullard. Well, there's no codes down here to tell us that it's a mullard. GEC, um, General Electric UK, of course, was in the UK big time. But when you see a label slapped on, that's often a rebrand sign. It should be should be a rebrand sign. In fact, labels are actually not that common. Normally, they just silk screen their own brand name on top. So I was pondering what these were. And at one point, I actually thought that these were Marconi Ostrom valves, which is also a big, was at the time, was a huge company, but they were big in the UK. And then I came, I did some more research when I was designing 
um, what is going to be hopefully a lovely single-ended power amp, a monoblock. And I had one of the tubes, all identical tubes, had MWT on it. And that's where I thought we had Marconi coming from. Well, I did some more research on something completely different, and somebody identified M MWT as an early logo of Mullard, Mullard wireless tubes. I thought, hallelujah, I've got a positive ID on a nice pile of these tubes, and I've got Mullards. Wow, what couldn't be better than that? Okay, so what is the power tube, the output tube, which is the heart of, of any amplifier, power amplifier? So I found a bunch of these really nice Russian power tubes, new old stock, and basically, these are, in English, these are 6P7Ss. In the Russian Cyrillic, they're 6N7Cs. They're all from 1971. And what really caught my eye is that the anode's up on the plate, just like the DET20s that we just looked at. And essentially, they're an octal version of the 807, which uses the US 5-pin base or they're a close copy. I'm not sure yet. There's not a lot of information yet. So I'm going to build a circuit based on the 807. and We'll see how they work in that circuit. But have a look at how there's, how the plate is set up on the mica spacers. There's some really nice ceramic spacers in here, if you can see them, all over the place. It's just the quality of the tube is really nice. There's not a lot online about how they're how they sound, but what I did find says that they they sound like like nothing else in a single-ended Class A design, and that's my favorite kind of power amplifier. It's been a long time since I designed and built one, and that's that's what's on the drawing board. In fact, I've made a quick little sketch. This is how my amplifier designs start, and uh, I just did that in a few minutes this morning just to get a handle on the parts, etc. And uh, the transformers are in order, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll get a working prototype together, because up until now we've been talking about preamps, and it would be really nice to have a single-ended monoblock to look at that's got affordable... Well, the front-end tube is not affordable, but they're available. The power tube, which can be very expensive, is definitely affordable. Okay, if you've stayed till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And remember, I've got uh, flat rate $20 shipping around the world and $150. If you, if you spend $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. And remember, there's some zones around the world in which there'll be a small shipping surcharge. It's just so expensive to get a box to you. But it, still, the shipping is never going to be expensive coming from me. Okay, folks, stay safe. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.